the 2010 Broadway revival, and that was where you first played Troy and Rose and Michael T. Williamson and Stephen Henderson played their parts in the, re in the revival. Can you talk a little bit about how that, how that play came about and, and your first experiences getting to know these characters? <laughs> uh, Scott Rudin called me uh, in 2009 and said that he has the screenplay that uh, August wrote and uh, I read it and I realized I hadn't read the play. And when I read the play, it said Troy Maxson, 53. I'm thinking I was too young to play Troy because I was thinking back in the 80s when I saw James Earl Jones and I realized I was going to be too old if I didn't hurry up. <laughs> so I called Scott and, uh, and said I want to do the play and, and uh, that's what we did. And so what was your experience first getting to play this character on stage? Um, I always tease Denzel about this because when we started rehearsal, I was so nervous <laughs> because we were following performances where people absolutely tattooed their artistry on these roles. But I said, okay. I have experience, I'm gonna rely on my experience. And I remember Denzel in the first rehearsal said, you know, I can't forget Mary Alice's performance <laughs> as Rose. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> right, out the, right from the start. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Um, you know what, the thing about it is, you can't miss with August. Mm -hmm. The words carry you exactly where you need to go. Um, it is a role, uh, for Rose, I, one of the things I always say, she is absolutely complete. Mm. Her journey is absolutely complete. It is no excess baggage, nothing. It's almost like being a, you know, I guess you have to be a surfer, but, but just riding the wave. Mm -hmm. And then it takes you where you, where you want, need to go. Right. Well, Todd, August Wilson passed away in 2005. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what happened, what was happening with the screenplay between, uh, the, between his passing, the revival, and, and the filming in 2006? My understanding, and tell me if I'm wrong, Paramount bought it in the 80s, the, the rights to the play, and for uh, Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy was going to uh, play The Sun. And uh, as is often the case, which a lot of you know out there, development takes a long time. <laughs> a long time. <laughs> and uh, they developed it, and then other actors came on, and then the project was put on the side for a long time, and there were change of heads at Paramount. And thank God Scott Rudin had a deal at the studio many years later and had the smarts enough to, because he knows theater, he's a big theater producer, to say, I want to take a stab at developing this with August Wilson. And so they worked together and uh, got a screenplay out of it. And then that kind of went to sleep for a while and it's kind of had ebbs and flows along the way for, since the 80s. And fortunately, uh, Denzel Washington came into it and that changed everything for everybody. So to start to talk about the production of the film a little bit, it feels very authentic uh, to say the least. And I think one of the reasons that is is because of the, of the costumes. Uh, Sharon, can you talk a little bit about um, where you started from to, to start your design work? Were they original? Uh, original designs, or did you start by researching the period or the place? I started with the play and the period. Mm. You know, I, I love the play, so I wanted to, you know, honor it. But I knew we were doing a film, which is, you know, we're, we're, it's more three-dimensional, we're on the street, it's a real location, and it becomes a little more real. So um, we did a lot of research, and there was an amazing, books out of the period in time. So I put together that and remnants of the play and came up with um, ideas for the clothes. Were there a lot of things, uh, big changes that you needed to make from the costumes that were in the play to, to the film? I, I would say there were important changes. So uh, the, a play is so intimate where mm -hmm. 
and film is so it's so close to you and it was we were actually in a real location and not on a stage so I I wanted it always to feel you, you would know these people if you saw them on the street mm -hmm. so I had to make that transition so when you were starting to put together the scenes were there any rules in terms of adherence to the the pace of the play or to you know anything going in there were rules that I didn't know about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there were good rules. Uh, you know, Denzel, everybody, when they were in Pittsburgh, were so busy. I mean, Denzel, I mean, I, this happens to me almost, almost every film now. We're going to talk, you know, we'll talk every week. <laughs> we talk twice and then it's over, you know, or I get a call at five in the morning or something like that, but they were so tired. So, no, there were no rules. I mean, I knew that I should adhere to the words because I, I learned very quickly that the words were going to drive the film. The, the, the words were the, were the music, mm -hmm. you know, so, but no, no, I mean, it's, it's the same as every film, as Denzel says, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's, as we talked about in the editing room so many times, it's, let's get the rhythm right and try to be it in the right place at the right time. But I'll say, and Hughes and I have worked together on a number of films, and Denzel and Hughes and I did The Great Debaters together. You have to have a skilled, sensitive editor that understands the little tiny things and the bigger things. And he has a really, really delicate touch. Otherwise, Denzel and I wouldn't have worked with him again. <laughs> and and he, 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 I mean, even his assemblage, when we first saw it, it was right. pretty great. Yeah, very great. So he... he his choices that he made. I mean, that's that's a very skilled editor, you know, and it and it feels seamless. Hopefully, when you watched it, but that that's hard to do. Well, and to the the rhythm of the language. I mean, is there a, or was there a substantial difference between establishing that rhythm on stage versus? I mean, it seems like on stage you have the audience's reactions that you have to adjust to, their gasps, their laughs, or whatever. And, and But when you're making a film, you can really dictate and set that rhythm uh, yourself deliberately. We actually had to do that with the play hmm. because... <laughs> I, I'm famous. <laughs> so You are. Yeah, so in the play, Troy, Troy uh, uh, Bono and I, we come out when we were rehearsing, we come right out talking. Mm -hmm. We the play starts, we come walking out. Well, the first night, the audience missed the first two minutes of the play because they were screaming and carrying on. And mm -hmm. so we had to do this whole remember the I had to do a fake entrance, come in, act like I'm doing something, put something down. I'd walk all the way through the house, I'd come all the way to the back. I'm like, hi, my old how you doing? <laughs> and they still clap. Yeah, I'd come back and see her. So you had to create this whole stage. You know, and now I see it with, with you know, and I, I didn't realize that they do that sometimes on Broadway. Mm -hmm. so you see, oh, they give the, the, the name brand person an entrance because mm -hmm. you're trying to get the Structure. audience to settle down before, right. yeah. And this play, this, when this was a play, it got a lot of response. Yeah, it got a lot of response. I, I'm, I'm being kind. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we would have to <laughs> stop a lot, mm -hmm. you know. Um, if anything, the film, you can get more into the rhythm right. more than anything. I remember uh, August, because when I did Seven Guitars, I did it for a year. Mm -hmm. We did it in different cities before it came to New York. So August would be in rehearsals all the time. And he would get in his seat, get down, cross his arms, and his head would go down. And I would go, oh, my God. August Wilson is falling asleep <laughs> during rehearsal? Somebody wake him up. It's just so unprofessional. <laughs> and then you'd go, and one of the things that people don't know about August, you never miss a word. You don't, you don't drop an and, an if, or whatever. It totally screws up the rhythm. Mm. And whatever word you come up with is not going to be better than the word he has on the page. Mm -hmm. So you'd be getting into it, get, and then his head would be down like that. Then you would miss a word, and he'd pop up, <laughs> grab his script, and go, look, and then look at you, then look at the script, and stop rehearsal. 
Wow. You missed an and, you missed an if, it messes up the rhythm, you got to go back and do it. So he was not asleep. Mm -hmm. He was listening. Mm -hmm. and, but it speaks to the poetry and the artistry of the language. And, and listen, as an actor, you've got to say it in a way that's seamless. So sometimes people just think, you know, it's one of my favorite lines that Troy says. It's like so, I know when, he, when you talk about Bonnie. Why don't you have a job? You talk, keep talking about Bonnie got a job. Why, why, why you? What that mean to me, Bonnie working? I don't care if she working. Go ask her for $10 if she working. I'm talking about Bonnie working. Why, why ain't you working? I love that. Yeah, and that's music. That's the music of it. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and he wrote, yeah. what that mean to me? Not what does that mean to yeah, me? Yeah, exactly. What that mean to me? What that yeah. mean to me, Bonnie working? That's what and he wrote. And he doesn't say, you know, she doesn't say, you know what, um, uh, from right now, this this child's got a mother. She doesn't say, but you know what? I'm gone. <laughs> or you out. <laughs> right. Or whatever. Right, right, she right. says, you are a womanless man. Wow. Mm -hmm. That has power. That has weight. And that speaks to the artistry, once again, of August Wilson. That's why he's up there with the greats. Well, I mean, but Viola, Rose does so many, I guess the word is contradictory things, right? Her character, I mean, she stands up for herself when Troy pushes her too far, but then... On the other hand, she stays with him. So, I mean, how do you, how do you reconcile those aspects of the character? I mean, the, I the reconcile it because that's what it means to be human. If you have lived any more than five minutes, you know that we are walking contradictions constantly. We are an amalgamation of saying one thing and meaning another, living one life. And we, listen, my mantra for 2016 is I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> I think that's a lot of ours. Yeah. And um, I think that, once again, that's the artistry of creating human beings, is creating those contradictions. And whenever you're trying to create someone who makes sense with everything that they do, then what you're doing is you're kowtowing to the needs of an audience mm. to keep them in a seat and to make it easy for them. I always say, even with my TV show, this is what I say. I say, listen... You have to come into my world every Thursday night at 10 o'clock. I'm not coming into your world. Because if I'm coming into your world, then you're not sh I'm not shifting and, and changing anything as an artist. That your job as an audience is to come locked and loaded. Mm -hmm. It's like Arthur Miller said, you know what? I don't write about the finest people who've ever lived, but a terrible thing has happened to them, so their stories deserve to be told. That's the basis for drama. And that was, yeah, absolutely. Well, we know that this is only one of 10 plays that August Wilson wrote in his Pittsburgh cycle, as it's called. And I think on behalf of everyone, you, this is so fantastic. One down, nine to go for all of you. For all no, of you. no pressure. Huh? No pressure. <laughs> Please join me in thanking all of our panelists, the filmmakers of Fences tonight. Thank you.